ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to this talk. I'm going to talk about Eastern meditation, but it's about Eastern meditation in unbiblical Christian meditation. It has also come into mindfulness therapy, MBCT, MBSR, for depression and for uh, stress. Uh, it is in self-help in a big way, self-help, wellness, and transformation. But as I speak, what I want you to focus on is the gold standard of biblical meditation. And then to measure the Eastern meditative techniques and the outcomes against this gold standard. All right? That will give us a, a, an anchor, a point of reference. Now, we'll look at Psalms 19, King David's meditation. In verse 14, he said, May the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord. So the first 13 verses are his meditation. And we'll scan it. The heavens, he said, declare universally God. His handiwork, his speech, his knowledge. And he said, the, the heat of the sun was like knowledge that no one can escape from. And before long, he saw the sun as the bridegroom, as a strong man to run a race from which nothing can be hidden. Then he began to meditate upon the law, the statutes, commandments, judgments. And he said these were better than fine gold, better than honey. And that they brought warning and reward. And then very quickly he came to this verse where he became completely transparent to God. In trust, he knew of God's love because he saw Jesus as the bridegroom and himself as the bride. And there was a, going to be a wedding. And he wanted to be pure for the bridegroom. So he said, clean me from my secret faults. Now, secret faults are faults that you don't even know about yourself. And he trusted God so much that he asked God to reveal to himself what he did not know about himself. That he may be pure. And then he said, keep me from presumptuous sins. Now, what are presumptuous sins? We may assume a lot of things about ourselves, things that are glorious and right. We'll do this for God and that for God. But he wanted to know if anything that he had assumed about himself was wrong, was presumptuous. So he trusted the Lord, opened his heart, became completely transparent. And in the strength of God's love, he wanted to be searched and to be made pure. So here is a man who meditated, and the outcome of that meditation is cleansing, it's purity. Now I want to show you then the Eastern meditators, what are their outcomes, and then you can compare. Now we've talked about the one on the, the right, where it's biblical, it's personal, it's love-based, that's King David's meditation. It's active, it's interactive, it's reflective, it's passionate, it's consummate, and purgative. Now on the left, you would see that there is Eastern and Western derivatives of Eastern meditation. They are focused on mantras, on breath. Now let me explain that to you. When I, I started life as a Zen meditator when I was 20 years old. Now I ignored the meditation techniques uh, and the, 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 the people who were meditating in my country, Malaysia and Singapore, they were in the temples meditating. But I had no regard for them. We, the, the community saw them as hermits and recluses. But I went to London. And in London, ah, the Beatles were doing meditation. The uh, celebrities and the movie stars. And there I could get English books on meditation. I picked up one and I got hooked. So London caused me to do Eastern meditation. <laughs> now, what is Eastern meditation? The uh, attempt to empty the mind, to reach silence, to, to empty your mind till a point of nothingness is uh, achieved. That is crucial to them. So the methods were following a mantra. Right? And in following the mantra, you keep out all incoming thoughts, 
Not just for minutes, for hours. And expecting something to happen. And what's this? We'll get into it. Now, there were other methods, following your breath. And I use as a Zen meditator, follow my breath. I count in cycles of ten, slowly, relaxedly, and then start one again. There was another method as a Zen meditator. It was a riddle, or the Japanese called it koon. Now, what, what's that riddle? It is to dwell upon the thought of what is the sound of one hand clapping. What's the sound of one hand clapping? Nothing. So now you understand how it works. So on the, on the eastern side, it's about emptying the mind. On the um, biblical side, it's about connecting with God interactively to know the glory of His love. And that love would work upon the man. And he would entrust of God, seek to be like God, right? to be raised from glory to glory. Now let's look more deeply. So there's a word that I'm introducing in this slide. It's called non-dual. Right? I'll describe it later. Uh, and that's part of Eastern meditation. So in comparison, biblical meditation is consummate, is passionate. It's about love. It's about God. Now, in a book called Buddha Pill, these were written by two psychologists, highly um, educated, um, highly achieved people. And they said that you can meditate on a mantra. It doesn't matter what the mantra is. It could be Sanskrit. It could be the word one. It made no differences. Things happen in the brain, in the mind, and that's what's important. In fact, one guru said, you can repeat the word Coca-Cola, 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 and the same effect takes place in the brain and then in the mind. Now, this is a picture of my late Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, this was after the financial crisis, 2008, uh, after his wife had passed away, um, and things were tumultuous, and he was stressed. And he wanted to find peace. And he was brought to this Benedictine monk who taught him Christian meditation, but Catholic meditation, really. And this monk gave him two mantras, a choice of two mantras. Right? He said to Mr. Lee, you can choose an, a Chinese mantra, which sounds like this, or may tofut. Or you can choose the Christian mantra, Maranatha. And Mr. Lee chose, in the newspapers, he said, I chose Maranatha because it's more uh, easier on my English tongue. He was English educated. All right? So now, it doesn't matter what you say with your mouth. It's what happens in the brain. Now, here's a picture of uh, brain waves. Now, right now, you folks are listening to me. You are comparing what I'm saying to what you know. You're analyzing what I'm saying. You're you are, you are, you are doubtful. Right? You're alert. That's a fast wave beta. When you go into meditation, you will, your brain waves will slow down. Or there will be more sleep waves. That's the alpha sleep wave, which is just pre-sleep. And then theta, which is deeper sleep. Now, as you know, if you were falling off to sleep, and I said 10 words to you, you may hear five and miss the other five, and it makes no sense to you. And in deep sleep, you may lose all ten. Right? So these are sleep waves. And in addition to sleep waves, there will be a calming of your amygdala. Now, your amygdala is what causes you stress. It's the fight and flight mechanism in your brain. If your boss had you working week after week, wants you to finish at five uh, no, on Friday and didn't give you help week after week, your amygdala would be overactive and you will have depression. Right, now, so when one meditates, the amygdala calms down. And if you were stressed and losing your concentration, oh, it's great, right? Your amygdala calms down, you regain your concentration. Now, but what they did was they experimented and studied mindful attention groups. And after training them on meditation, 
They s- tested them on their reaction to delightful images and frightening images. And this, this test was done three weeks after they stopped meditation. Now what they found was, three weeks after, after they stopped, the delightful images were not as delightful. The frightening images were not as frightening. They are sedated. Now, if you had stress and losing your concentration by doing meditation, you regain your concentration because your amygdala calms down. That's fine. That's good. But when you return to normal and you thought, I'll do more meditation to give myself a lift, you're wrong. It sedates you. All right? So it is only a temporary, what do you call a, a plaster, uh, a, a temporary fix. All right? Now, meditation causes endogenous dopamine. Now, what's endogenous dopamine? It's dopamine that your own brain secretes. And you get 65% more endogenous dopamine. Now, dopamine causes addiction. That's why meditators meditate, meditate, meditate. I used to go to Bali, the center of Bali, where the tourists, tourists like the, the south, the, the wind and the surf and, and the, the nightlife, you know. And they go to the, the center of Bali, which is very beautiful, but they don't last for more than a night. And I met this uh, hotel manager, and he said to me, um, when the, the tourists come from the south, they come at most for a night. The, uh, the beautiful scenes would bore them, and they would quickly go back to the south. And so he asked me, what are you doing here? You're not meditating. Right? I said, yeah, who comes here all the time then? He said, only meditators come here. They come here, they meditate for five days, five hours a day. They don't even talk to the person next to them because everything is happening in the brain. All right? So dopamine causes addiction, that's one thing. It also causes visualization. And the research says it's heightened sensory imagery. So if you are meditating with lots of dopamine, you may be able to see energy as light or music as light. If you are predisposed to be uh, a religious person, you may see angels, you may see God. Yeah, that's dopamine. Now in yoga nidra, they looked at the brain as it was functioning and as the people were doing yoga nidra, there was a decreased blood flow in the frontal cortex. Blood flow just goes down. Now that is not good because the frontal cortex is where a lot of functions are. Right? That is where your will is, where your reality, where your love is. Yeah? It's also the place of making peace. The, the scientist calls it mediation, to mediate, to make peace. Now, they also looked at the temporal lobe of people in meditation. And these people, uh, Dr. Persinger and uh, Stanley Coran, they developed what, they, what was called a God helmet. And the God helmet had uh, magnetic resonance, mild pulses to stimulate the temporal lobe. And what they found was people with this stimulation sensed presences in the room apart from themselves. They experienced what they perceived as God. 80% of the participants experience a presence besides them in the room. Right? That's the temporal loop going off. Right? Now, Andrew Newberg, one of the noted uh, researchers, he said the temporal loop are clearly important in religious and spiritual experiences. So there you are. Now, hypnosis, Columbia University. Now, there are a lot of words, um, but I'll try to explain it rather quickly. What they found was 30% of Americans can be hypnotized. And after they are successfully hypnotized, they look at the brain, the frontal lobe. And there are two places in the frontal lobe. One is called the anterior cingulate cortex. I'll call it the ACC. It's responsible for your will, the strength of your will. There's another part called the lateral frontal cortex, or the LFC. That's responsible for reality. And what they found was, after hypnosis, after someone is successfully hypnotized, 
one or the other is switched off. I'm sorry. One or the other. If either one is switched off, they're hypnotized. Now, the point really is, the will and reality are always active in your frontal lobe. It's your sentry. It's your guard to know, to, to be willful in doing the, what is real, what is good. Right? So, now I want to tell you a story <clears throat> um, to, to reflect what hypnosis is. Imagine me being asked to go to a, a charismatic church where they're speaking in tongues. And I've never been there before, never heard tongues before. I go in with my friends, and people are speaking in tongues and falling on the floor. And they say, this is God or the Holy Spirit. And at, all at once, my will and my reality are active. And my reality says, oh, this is not real. And my will says, I'm not falling for this. And I walk out, and I don't fall for it. Right? But a week later, my friends say, come, come, come. We want to introduce you to some important people, right? some good people. So I go again. And this time, same scene, but they introduced me to the top surgeon in town, the top doctor, the top lawyer, and they're all speaking in tongues. And so I say, oh, my reality begins to wane. This must be real. Top people, the good people are speaking in tongues. So it goes off, and I'm in. The suggestion that if I should speak in tongues, and that God is in me, with me, has come true. That is the suggestion. That is the hypnotic suggestion. So the hypnosis is not about um, someone waving a watch in your face. It's the situation created to suggest something to you. Now, Andrew Newberg said something further. He was looking at people who were speaking in tongues, the frontal lobe. And he had them do, the same person, do gospel music and speak in tongues in the very next moment switching from one to the other. And he looked at their brain as it worked. When they were speaking in tongues, the frontal lobe was off, down. When he told them, now switch to gospel music, the frontal lobe was on. Now switch back, he went off. Now imagine this. Now I'm speaking in tongues with my friends. My frontal lobe is down. And the suggestion further is, if I should be deeper in with the Holy Spirit, I'd be slain. And because my frontal lobe is down, both ACC and LFC and the will and the reality are down, I am in. And that's how it works. Now, <clears throat> let's look a bit further at this. Right? The founder of hypnotism is actually James Bray, 1840. Now, he, he thought that in hypnotism, someone has to hypnotize the other. That's essential. Then he wrote a book, and the book went far and wide. And his friends in the East said, James, uh, the folks in the East in meditation are hypnotizing themselves without another person. And James looked at this and finally agreed. And he said, there is no need for an exoteric influence. Exoteric means external influence. So folks can hypnotize themselves. Now, 30% of Americans can be hypnotized externally. But if you were doing meditation, because it closes down your frontal lobe, 100% of meditators can self-hypnotize. Right? And the suggestion, all kinds of suggestion can come through. Further, Andrew Newberg said, in his studies, that meditation-based practices affect beliefs and experiences through a frontal parietal network, a relationship of two lobes in the brain. Now, let's look at what he means. Oh, furthermore, if you do a research on uh, frontal lobe and, and meditative practices, what you will see is this very common phrase, the frontal lobe goes offline, right? completely Offline, right? What does it mean, right? Now, Andrew Newberg looked at Tibetan meditators, and they're doing mantras, right? Now, what are mantras? Mantras are to 
deny all incoming mandate, all incoming information to the point that there is to be nothing in your thoughts. Now, as you deny information, the parietal goes down. Now, what is the parietal? The parietal is what tells you where you are in three-dimensional space. All right? There you are sitting, 20 feet from me, 10 feet from the ceiling, and you've got your arms crossed. It gives you a sense of your body shape. And suddenly, in med medita meditation, you lose that sense. You lose your position in three-dimensional space. You lose a sense of your body shape. And then suddenly, you feel that you are part of the whole universe. And the whole universe is part of you. Now, at that point, it's so dramatic that you've got to make sense of it. You have become, you have become limitless. You're physically limitless, mentally limitless, and spiritually limitless. You've got to make sense of it. And if you should be meditating with Hindus, they will say, you've reached nirvana. Now that is the suggestion. Your frontal lobe is down. Cerebral blood flow is down. All right? You have starved the frontal lobe to the point that it is active, but you have denied its functions. You're giving it no data. The parietal goes down. And now the suggestion, you're in nirvana. If you were Buddhist, they'd say, you have been awakened. You have reached Buddhahood. Now, Christians are doing this now. Mantras. Christian mantras. Maranatha. What happens? The Christian meditating group will say, you have come into the presence of God. Same neural phenomena. Different interpretations. Now, here is John Grafman. He's a cognitive neuroscientist and the director of brain injury research in Chicago. And this is what he said. This is very important. Focus on this. The frontal lobe are the most evolved areas of the human brain and help control and make sense of the perceptual input we get from the world. Further investigation revealed that damage to a specific area of the brain, known as the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, was linked to markedly increased mysticism. When the frontal lobe inhibitory functions, in other words, it controls, inhibitory functions are suppressed, damaged, right? A door of perception can open, increasing the chances of mystical experiences. Now, those frontal lobes are damaged and they get mystical experiences. Now imagine this. People are meditating. The blood flow, cerebral blood flow goes down. The frontal lobe is there, it's functioning, it's normal. But the activity goes down as if it was damaged. Right? In mantra meditation, they are meditating on mantras, denying information, starving the, the frontal lobe of information, suppressing it as if it is damaged. So, mystical experiences. Right? Now, this is the icon of meditators. At one moment, you're that drop of water. At another moment, you have fused into the cosmic ocean. You are one with the universe, and the universe is one with you. The uh, Hindus call it nirvana. The Zen meditators call it satori. Oneness is a common word for it. Moment of realization, enlightenment, cosmic consciousness. And now, Christians call it oneness with God. Now here, at this point, I need to talk to you about non-dual, or Buddha's non-dual. I want to get you familiar with this term and what it means. When a meditator gets to that stage of when he is one with the universe, he is without limit. There's no physical limit, there's no mental limit, and there's no spiritual limit. So he gets to a point where, for example, if we were 50 people in this room meditating and we all reached that point, they would say, we are of one consciousness. We are all one in consciousness. Now, that's the sweet end of meditation, where we can be one. So, when applied correctly, applied to you and I, it's very sweet. But they also apply it dangerously and spiritually. Now, in the spiritual realm, there is good and evil. But at the non-dual, when they get to non-duality, they do not differentiate between good and evil. 
No life and no death. No sin, no righteousness. No heaven, no hell. And no God, no Satan. Now, is that dangerous? Right? Is that dangerous? The kids now are playing games. Right? Games that are called by the name Beyond Good and Evil. And you see graphics like The Good Evil. These are what is called non-dual. Now let me explain non-duality a bit further. Now, the non-duality of Buddha. He was a prince in a palace. The king and queen loved him and did not want him to see old age and death. So they brought in young servants, retired old servants. Buddha got uh, raised, uh, got married, had kids, never saw death until one day he followed a charioteer out of the palace walls. And for the first time, he saw death. He saw a corpse. He saw a funeral. And it terrified him. He saw suffering. And the Buddhists say he felt compassionate for suffering. And to find peace, he meditated. And finally found peace in meditation. And in that moment of awakening or liberation, they call it, he was liberated from karma and from reincarnation. Now, what is karma? Karma is when you do some evil, you do some good. You balance the account. That's karma. And if you should have a negative karma account, in your next life, in reincarnation, you may become a, a pig or a rat. All right? Now, how was Buddha, in meditation, liberated from karma, from good and evil? Because in that state, that mind state, what they call the ultimate mind state. There was no need, or he could not differentiate between good and evil. And where there's no good and evil, there's no karma. So he was liberated from karma. Right? And at the same time, in that mind state, there was no life, no death. So he was liberated from reincarnation. So that was a moment of delight and euphoria. Right? So that's non dual Okay, but this is applied to a whole realm of things, good and evil, heaven and hell, God and Satan. And the young kids are drawing these uh, graphics, the good evil. And this one, uh, it speaks for itself. Okay, this one, not boy, not girl, not man, not woman. All right, think about it in non-dual terms, right? In our modern society, All right? Man, woman. If they were non-dual, not differentiated, they are actually a new entity, a third entity. And this third entity is not man, not woman. You follow this? That's non-duality in our context. This is yin-yang, the, uh, the icon of yin-yang. Now they have put a rainbow around it. Right? So it's yin-yang, not man, not woman. Now what does yin-yang mean? Yin yang means polar opposites, right? Black and white, good and evil, heaven and hell. The Taoist regard yin yang not as two, yin and yang. The Taoist uh, master, right? If you are a good, successful Taoist man, you have fused yin and yang together as one. Non dual. So there's non duality in Taoism. And yin and yang. Now, Carl Jung, the noted psychiatrist, he said, he, ob he observed Taoism and he said, the Taoist feels and, and, and his philosophy is that man is the reconciler of opposites. If you are a successful man, a successful Taoist, you, are, you reconcile yin and yang in yourself. That is non dual. Taoism. Now, Tai Chi. Now, you've seen people do Tai Chi. Yeah? They go through that motion. That whole motion is physically to blend yin and yang. If you were a novice and you couldn't blend yin and yang, you're just doing exercise. But the master is the one who successfully fuses yin and yang into one supreme ultimate. 
It's ultimate and it's supreme. It's the supremacy of non-dual expressed in exercise in yin and yang. And here you see symbols. It's an interlock of white and black, of good and evil, interlocked forever. That is the regarded as the supreme ultimate. Now, Socrates and Plato, Greek philosophy. The opposites are thesis and thesis. Right? Truth is not found in either side. Truth is found somewhere in the blending, in synthesis. So non-dual is in Greek philosophy. Now, Socrates, um, he committed suicide, drank Hamlock. But he died happy because he felt that he was liberating his good spirit from his bad body. He conceived of man as bad body and good spirit. Non-dual philosophy. And here's a picture of um, a Taoist in meditation. And he has a good spirit in him. But the body is the body. <laughs> Bad. And you also see um, the modern man. Right? He has a little man in his head and it, and it says, Hi, I'm the mental property, the real me. My motivations are always good. Whatever I do with my body is what I do with my body. And furthermore, Postmodernism, relativism, you think what you want, I think what I want, and yet we are in agreement. We do not need to differentiate. So it's in our everyday life, our everyday culture, our attitudes. Now, this is Bahomet. Right? This statue, this horrifying statue, was to be placed in Detroit just in January this year. It was to be placed there opposite the Ten Commandments. Now, what does Bahomet represent? The BBC wrote about it. Bahomet is a hermaphrodite, not man, not woman, non-dual. He joins together human and animal, non-dual. Male and female, above and below, heaven and hell, non-dual. He embodies opposites, celebrates contrast, reconciles opposites. He represents differences without conflict. So when they wanted to put this opposite the Ten Commandments, it wasn't in opposition. It was to show that they celebrated contrast, non-dual. That's how this, this is the kind of enlightened non-dual philosophies that is in our midst. Now, take the theory of evolution. What's the difference between Bahomet and the theory of evolution? Man and animal as one. So one that is in our genes. <laughs> A non-dual theory. So, this uh, meditation, this moment of reality, the moment of when we as a the meditator, as a drop of water, blends with everything, when we become, when the meditators become limitless, that is their moment of non-duality. They become without limit. Now, Ellen White said, at times, it seems as if my heart would break as I think of the so-called higher science. Theories that are coming in. Of these theories, Satan is the Alpha and the Omega. Men are grasping sentiments that exalt men, placing him where God should be. And so we see non-duality, Buddhist Hinduism, it's in our culture, is in Greek philosophy, is in exercise, and now it is in therapy. Mindfulness therapy for stress and for depression. Now think about this. When King David was meditating, he wanted to distinguish between good and evil. He wanted to be searched for any weakness in his heart. 
any presumptuous sins. When a meditator meditates and gets to non-duality, he does not and cannot differentiate between good and evil. So he does not come to the outcome that King David would come to. King David's outcome is to recognize his weakness so that he may be cleansed, he may be healed. A meditator comes to the point of non-duality and what happens? He doesn't differentiate between good and evil. If there were any weaknesses, it would be swept under the carpet. He will not distinguish between sin and righteousness. And as Christians, we say, mature Christians, no discernment. Yeah? From the use of discernment. That's what the Bible says. So the outcomes are completely different. And where is the source of philosophy, of uh, thought, of ideology? It comes from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? At that time, when Satan tempted Eve to come away from God to eat of his tree, he said, come over. Come over, leave God, who is absolutely good, and come over, I've got something better. In fact, Ellen White said, the temptation was, God is keeping something better away from you. Now, how much better? Oh, you'll be immortal, divine. You'll be awakened. You'll be as gods. Now, he said, knowing good and evil. Now, what did he mean? If, was he saying to Eve, come over from absolute good and discern between good and evil? No. Obviously, if Eve came over and discerned good and evil, she would leap back to God. So what he said was, come over, away from good, and come beyond good and evil. Come to a non-dual state where you do not differentiate between good and evil. That was the temptation. Now next, in the next uh, video, I'm going to talk about what is spiritualism. I'm going to emphasize how non-dual is the foundation of spiritualism. I'm going to emphasize Satan's lies in Eden, how they are now fully developed spiritualism, and what role it has to play in the end of time. And you have seen that spiritualism or non-dualism is in every facet of life. Now, I'm going to show you information that it was central in what Pope Francis said to the U.S. Congress in September 2015. That non-dual was in a song sung by Shakira at the United Nations in honor of Pope Francis. A non-dual song. And I'm going to show you where is non-dual in the Bible. That's important, isn't it? So, come, watch the next video.